Welcome to Zcast, everyone. I'm Zias Caraval from ZK Research, and I'm here at MWC 25 in Barcelona. I'm with Phil Mottram, uh, EVP and GM of the networking division at HPE. Right. Uh, Phil, how's it been going? Yeah, very good. Yeah, pretty busy. Uh, first day, obviously, so you're my second meeting. Yeah, well... But, uh, this is obviously going to be the highlight of the uh, week. Yeah, normally I'd ask you what are your thoughts from the show, but we just started. So, <laughs> uh, so let's take a little bit of a step back, though, right? This is a show that historically is focused on telco transformation. Yep. Um, I think uh, the telco's ability to transform themselves has been, let's say, spotty over the years. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on now with cloud and AI and 5G and things. And so, uh, where do you think we are with telco transformation and what's different today than maybe a couple of years ago? Um, yeah, I think, as you quite rightly say, I think telcos, I mean, the good thing about telco is it's a pretty predictable business, isn't it? I mean, if you've got, you know, 50 million subscribers on a mobile network, typically they'll stay with you, providing you're doing a good job. So, it's normally got predictable uh, revenue streams. But yeah, for some reason, they've struggled to uh, transform. I guess the thing that we've noticed uh, last year and this year as well, it's all about AI now, isn't it? Yeah. And I think telcos are looking at that with two lenses. One is how can they use technology or AI technology to improve their efficiency? Uh, and that might be helping staff, service customers, etc. And then we also see some telcos as well looking at AI as a revenue opportunity as well. So actually, we as HPE, you know, have got a lot of heritage and experience in terms of building supercomputers. And some of that experience is very helpful in an AI world. So we help lots of the big model builders build AI models. We've helped helped a lot of governments build sovereign AI clouds, but we're also seeing telcos um, asking us to build them a cloud that they will then sell to their business customers as well. So I think uh, telcos, it's two sides to the coin. One is how can they use AI to drive more sales? And then the other side of it is how can they use AI technology to do things better? Now, so it's fair to say that uh, the telcos didn't capitalize on cloud like like they could have, right? It being a network-based service. And uh, I think they are trying to rethink their strategy in the AI era. Um, and what is it about them, do you think, that gives them maybe a un unique edge in AI? Is it, is it the network or is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, Well, also telcos have got good customer relationships, haven't they? I mean, typically, if, you've got, if you're a telco and you've got a, a relationship with an enterprise customer, I mean, uh, quite often you've had that experience, you've had the relationship for a long time and your infrastructure is embedded in the infrastructure of the enterprise customer, isn't it? So actually it's quite easy to bridge from the network into AI and I think that's the advantage that the telcos have. Yeah, well, and you could argue that compute and AI, compute, networking, security, it's all kind of coming together. Oh, completely. Team. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was certainly, for, so from a HPE angle, we certainly see networking and security coming together for sure. And I think cloud and AI uh, complement that. But yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons we bought uh, a security company about 18 months ago called Axis Security, because yeah. we see kind of uh, networks and security coming together under the SASE framework. Okay. Now let's uh, shift gears, talk about HPE specifically a little bit. It's yep. been about two years since uh, the Athenet acquisition. How, how's that been going? Yeah, we're, we're really pleased. I mean, it was a great company, uh, really, really good people, based out of Venice in Italy, so uh, worst places to be uh, yeah. located, as yeah. <laughs> sure you can imagine. But yeah, I mean, our strategy well, there... Well, an analyst event there, maybe sometime. Yeah, yeah. Exactly <laughs> right, yeah, we can go there after this. If yeah. You're. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, our focus really has been twofold, really. There's some um, segments of the market that are interested in more high-end, kind of bespoke 5G services. So think military, think warehouses, think ports, those sorts of customers. Uh, and then more broadly, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make private 5G as easy to sell and service as Wi-Fi. So that's one of the things that we've been focused on for the last 12 months. Yeah is embedding it in the same contract, same SLA, same support experience as Wi-Fi. So therefore, it's just easy for customers to buy and consume. Now, do you still find there's some confusion around uh, private 5G? I, I find when you say 5G to a customer, they some a lot of times they think telco and you know the, that type of service where private 5G is actually quite a different animal. Yeah. And, and companies that have tried it before uh, you know, I've maybe gone to a carrier grade company, which let's face it, that's a lot more complicated. And so it seems that uh, the awareness of what, how you go to market trying to make it more like Wi-Fi is still relatively low. 
Yeah, yeah. no, I think that's right. And I also think that the the local spectrum regulations has quite a big impact as well, doesn't yeah. it? Because in some countries, the local regulator has sold all the 5G spectrum to the operators. So if you want to deploy private 5G, you have no other choice, but you have to go to the telco operator, yeah. right? And they'll give you a private segment or a, or a segment of their private 5G network. Whereas in other countries like... Um, the UK, the US, um, you know, the regulators are either giving away free spectrum in CPRS or in the UK, I think you can actually phone up Ofcom and, and buy some local uh, spectrum. So I think it's also influenced by the spectrum policy of the mm -hmm. local regulator. And then you, you had talked about some of the use cases, uh, military, warehousing, right? Those are very traditional private cellular industries. Are you seeing more broad use cases in other industries that maybe weren't so interested in private cellular before? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of different use cases for it. One of my favorite stories is um, we do a lot of work with the Ryder Cup in Europe, yeah. where we build their infrastructure for them every time they do uh, the Ryder Cup. Um, you're a big golfer, aren't you? So you're yeah. familiar with the uh, <laughs> the tournament every few years. The Europeans give the the Americans a bit of a pasting, don't we? From yes. what I remember. Yeah, no, that but, was a, that was a pasting. That was uh, there's no question. But the about last that. one was done in yeah. Italy, in Rome, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. And obviously, one of the problems of um, digging infrastructure in Rome is, you know, you have to be very careful around historical artifacts, etc. And if you dig something, it's then closed. You have to stop yeah. digging for like six months, right? So when we built the infrastructure for the Ryder Cup course in Italy, we used private 5G to link all of the holes because that was way safer and easier versus digging up the uh, course to lay uh, In fact, that was one of the best use cases I've seen for private 5G and Wi-Fi combined. Uh, yeah. you know, Wi-Fi yeah. became fan-facing and private 5G was the backhaul. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you actually really good. solar power it, so yeah, that was yeah. pretty, yeah. But that whole backhaul concept, I mean, by the way, we see that in mines as well. So in some of the mines in Australia, people are using private 5G to do the backhaul link down the mine, and then actually at the bottom of the mine, they're using Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. So anyways, I'm hopeful that we see more of that, and I do think it, uh, uh, I think customers now are starting to understand, right, for ultra-reliable um, uh, 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 private cellular is uh, superior to Wi-Fi, but for general use and ubiquity, Wi-Fi still has a lot of advantages as well. And really, uh, I've been asked over the years is, in fact, I think one of the disservices the industry had initially was a lot of people thought the private 5G would universally displace Wi-Fi, which it's both, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think, you know, I think where I think about it is where... Outdoor coverage is important, and, and, and mainly it's because you have to maintain less infrastructure with private 5G, and then when speed is important, they're the use cases for private 5G. Yeah. Now, uh, you also had a number of announcements uh, this week at yep. MWC, and I'll, the headline was Accelerating Innovation for Service Providers to Help Capitalize on High Growth Opportunities at MWC 2025 which is a mouthful, but I think that's really what they're looking for is a way to accelerate their revenue opportunities. Yeah, exactly uh, right. Um, yeah. Now, within that, you had a number of products. First was the CX8325P switch, and it had a pretty interesting feature called precision timing capability. So can you talk about what that is and how yeah. it helps that, that industry? Yeah, sure. So within networks, um, typically the timing um, protocols have been driven by the optical networks. Then what we've done now is we've built it into our um, switch. And where that's important is if you think about some environments like a stadium, right? When they're trying to coordinate sound around a stadium, yeah. particularly at big concerts, they have to make sure it's absolutely um, precision, very, very precise, the way they're deploying the sound to the speakers. And so having this PTP uh, functionality, which is the precision timing protocol within the switches within the stadium, makes it way easier for stadium um, technology managers to deploy sound systems across the stadium. So that's one use case example. Other use case examples would be around autonomous vehicles, because obviously yes. you want to make sure that the, uh, the timing's good there as, as well. Yeah, that one's interesting too, because at, um, at CES during his keynote, uh, uh, Jensen Huang, the NVIDIA CEO, yeah. talked about on the next wave of AI would be physical AI, yeah. where really everything that you 
that moves will eventually be autonomous. In fact, he said, 10 years, you won't mow your lawn. You'll just tell your autonomous lawnmower to go do it. <laughs> and there's a lot of network implications to yeah. that. But I think the, the timing part that you brought up become industry. And, yeah, exactly you know, right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. So we're excited about the announcement. It's got some good feedback from analysts and customers. So, yeah. Yeah. Now, you, you also uh, announced a T-Mobile partnership. <clears throat> Can you yeah. talk about that? Yeah, sure. So, um, what T-Mobile, um, obviously very successful in the U.S., in particular targeting uh, enterprise customers, and then what they're doing is they're using the Aruba technology for some of the kind of smaller business customers. So what we've done is we've wrapped some of our Aruba products up for them, specifically in the spaces of Wi-Fi switching and uh, cellular 5G gateway, uh, and they're taking those products to market to their customers. So we're really excited about that partnership. Yeah, and uh, in fact, of all the U.S. telcos, I think T-Mobile's been... Uh Really the one trying to redefine what service looks like, ease of use, uh, things like that. I know as a former IT pro who used to buy telco services, ease of use wasn't really their calling <laughs> card. So it's, it's good to see some focus on that, though. Yeah, they're a great yeah, partner yeah. of ours, so we're excited about the uh, opportunity. Yeah, and then the, the last announcement was the DL, the ProLiant, new ProLiant DL110. Yeah. Um, with uh, it's, it's, uh, Intel Xeon. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's our latest uh, compute um, platform. We do a lot of business as a company with um telecoms operators around the world and and in the compute space we typically tailor our products to meet their requirements because obviously they have certain requirements around size of equipment form factors the ability to perform in uh, extreme temperatures be it hot or cold so we do, we do a lot of work um, tailoring our compute platforms for telecoms operators and the DL110 uh, is the latest announcement uh, in that space Okay, good. And uh, so let's wrap up just on the, the show itself. Yeah. Uh, uh, this is day one, early day one. Uh, as we go through the show, what are you hoping to see here? Um, I hope to see some really good use cases for AI. I mean, I think that's obviously the yeah. big buzz at the moment, isn't it? But I think people struggle with, okay, I think they all understand it now conceptually, but it's kind of like, okay, how do you then land that and make it really tangible for a telco in terms of either generating new revenues or driving out cost or making them more efficient. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, wandering around the hall later and just seeing what people have got on the stand, see what ideas they've got. Yeah, I imagine you're going to see AI in probably 90% of the, the stands here. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, do you think this year will be the a year of AI or do you think it's the year of AI kicking the tires? Um, I think it's the, uh, look, I think I think the next sort of five years will be the years of AI, but what we're seeing is a kind of steady flow down, aren't we? So maybe last year and the year before it was the year of the AI model builder. Then we moved into yeah. the year of the sovereign AI cloud builder. And now I think we're starting to see either big telcos or enterprise customers deploying uh, AI. So I think it's going to be a multi-year thing. I think one of the things this industry still needs from a maturation perspective too is, is just a general understanding of the role of the network in AI. I think it's been pretty well documented that the, the GPU plays an important role, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, uh, the cloud does to some degree, but I think the role the network plays is still largely misunderstood. Yeah, that's right. And I think, yeah, like I, I think AI's got lots of benefits for, uh, for telcos. And I think just in terms of just making the more efficient you know if, if they can use AI technology to self heal networks spot problems you know fix things before they start to go wrong I think that's going to make a huge well, difference to the operations of telcos well and they have so much data if they could use AI to be able to make that customer facing I mean that would be a gold mine for yeah, exactly them. right yeah. and that's that's where there's the uh, revenue opportunity for them yeah well maybe you can help them with that yeah indeed <laughs> so, anything else you want to add <laughs> no no that's all good great yeah, to uh, great to see you again yeah and it's great seeing you and I uh, always appreciate your time Phil yeah no thanks a lot so yes. yeah so on behalf of uh, Phil Mottram from HPE. I'm Zia Scaravalli from ZK Research, and thanks for watching. Uh, give us a like and hit the subscribe button, and I'll see you next time on my next episode of ZCast. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>